pleasure to introduce our speaker and our, talk it, and our topic. Over the course of 31 years as a professional naturalist, John Bates has focused on the natural history of the Northwoods. He launched his career with an MS in environmental science from the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. He has served on many boards and organizations devoted to the preservation of our natural resources. For example, example, he currently serves on the board of the Northwoods Land Trust. His many books, innumerable presentations and guided treks continue to entice and enable the rest of us to venture outdoors and get the most out of the adventure. And I've got right here, my copy of John's Seasonal Guide to the Natural he Year, Nin uh, yeah, 1997 copyright and I imagine there have been several since then and it's bookmarked to January. <laughs> As an interpretive naturalist John weaves scientific facts with personal anecdotes to create narratives as alluring as his wife Mary's fiber arts. And speaking of John's sources of strength and base of operations and his family, John and his wife fiber artist Mary Burns live on the Manitowish River in Iron County, Wisconsin, where they have raised two daughters. There's where he's coming from. <laughs> Regarding our topic, we're being informed, I guess uh, necessarily bombarded about climate change from all angles. One way to impress upon us the existential disaster that man-made climate change may have in store for us is to present scientific modeling and graphic projections. But in today's presentation, we're going to bring the essence of climate change down to earth to examine it in terms of how our forests and waters and the birds, mammals, and fish that dwell in those places are being affected. How are things trending? What's at stake? What needs to be done and how do we start? With that, John Bates, the virtual podium is yours. Please share your screen. <laughs> okay. Are you seeing the screen? You bet. Yep, yes, Excellent. indeed. Excellent, okay. Thank you for that nice introduction, really nice introduction. Thank you for mentioning my wife and my daughters, uh, without whom I would be far less of who I am than, than uh, who I am today, I guess. Very, very blessed to say the least, to live in such a loving family and such a beautiful place. All righty. Um, a disclaimer to begin, I'm not a climatologist. Uh, I have spent much of my career trying to decipher higher level science that is generally above my head and bring it down to earth for all of us regular folks who are uh, trying to make sense out of this world. So that's what we'll try to do within this uh, uh, talk today. Um, take a lot of climate change data and, uh, and, and create a story of, of what this uh, what the impacts are, are already and what they're likely to be. So a place is a space with a story. I always like to start there. Uh, and the Northwoods has, is a huge novel, a massive uh, doorstop of a novel, thousands and thousands of stories. But the particular story we're gonna focus on today, uh, of course, is climate change. And I, I wanna just start with some background that'll help us really um, take a look at where we're going. And, uh, because the Northwoods, is, I think, is misunderstood to a certain extent as a uh, uh, as a as a biome. Okay, so uh, on this particular slide, you'll see the Northwoods on on the upper left is this green area through uh, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. But the folks up in Canada laugh when we call ourselves the Northwoods. Uh, they are the true northern forest. It's the Canadian boreal forest. So. That's the true northern forest. We're a transition zone between the boreal forest and between what's called the southern hardwood forest or oak, which includes oak savanna and, and prairie country. So we're this rather narrow band of, uh, 
of life, of a community of life that is, that is rather specific to this place. Uh, and we are this, uh, often the southernmost range of a whole lot of northern species. And we'll talk about that relative specifically to the tension zone, the, the whole macro climate in which we are present in Wisconsin. Hopefully you're all familiar with the tension zone. This is that area that runs basically through the center of the state, uh, northwest to southeast there where northern species uh, achieve their southernmost range and then fall out because it's frankly too warm for them to go any further south. And where southern species uh, come to an end in their range uh, because now it's getting too cold. So if you're in those central counties, Portage, Wapaka, Outagamie, Brown, so forth, you are in uh, the best place, uh, botanically speaking, for, for seeing uh, shrubs and trees and, and herbaceous species and so forth. Uh, but if you're in far north, uh, iron bilis, uh, you'll see that there's only one species that achieves a range uh, a boundary up where we are. And same if you look at the far southern uh, end of, of Wisconsin and Lafayette and Green and Rock counties down there, there are very few species that reach a, a, a range boundary down there. So this tension zone is, is critical to how we look at climate change from a... Um, down to earth perspective what we're doing fundamentally is moving this tension zone northward through climate change. So it's a function, the tension zone uh, is important to note that it's not just a, a function of temperature, it's a function also of moisture, rain and snow, and it's a function of soil type. So you see how, the, how it swings southeast uh, down towards Milwaukee and that's the function of Lake Michigan keeping those uh, counties along the eastern edge uh, cooler and it swings northwest upward because now you're getting drier up into northwestern Wisconsin and that changes uh, where, where our plant life uh, resides. So let's take a look at the early vegetation of Wisconsin map so we know because vegetation is going to determine all the wildlife that we have at you know, the base of the food chain right. So think back on that tension zone and you can see exactly where that line goes across this early vegetation map. And this is a simplified map. There's lots more complex maps that are just a blizzard of, of color and hard to decipher, frankly. Uh, but you can see uh, in the northern part of the state that dark green is, is the dominant uh, forest community and that's called a northern mesic forest. Mesic means moist. And that's a forest community of uh, oh, eastern hemlocks, yellow birch, sugar maple, uh, basswood with, with some white pine mixed in. Uh, and that's on the better soils, and soils is in large quotes because our soils aren't, aren't good, to say the least. But on the very, very poor soils of northern Wisconsin, which uh, you see is in red in Vilas County and Oneida County in particular, and then in the far northeast and the far northwest, those are the very poor sands. And on those uh, uh, soils, we have uh, pine communities. Pine can tolerate drought better than those uh, species of the mesic forest and they, they dominate in lower forests. And you'll note also that there are some yellow areas, again, in the Northeast, North Central, and far Northwest that are dotted with red, and those are pine barrens. And that is the absolute worst soil we have. And those are kind of equivalent to oak savannas. Um, if you're not familiar with this kind of community, historically, these were fire-based systems, like an oak savanna is in the Southern part of the state, uh, where jack pine predominated on these really poor sands and we'd have fires every decade or so roaring on through. And so basically a grassland with scattered jack pine. So we have some different forest communities based on, uh, oops, that didn't work. Let's try. Huh. Not moving at all. That's not good. There we go. Sorry for making those funny noises. Uh, if you look at the soil regions of Wisconsin, you can see that the, the H, that yellow where we are in Vilas and Oneida counties in particular, and I assume you're, most of you are from this particular area of North Central Wisconsin, um, uh, you'll see that sand, forested sandy soils, and, and you'll see that in the far Northeast and the far Northwest. So where these so sandy soils are, we have these different forest communities and that alters to some extent the uh, vegetational community certainly and alters uh, the wildlife associated with the vegetational community. So keep that in mind as we go along what the soil types are and where that tension zone is and how again, as we raise temperatures, we're gonna be moving north with that tension zone. And you can see that tension zone, all of you have seen it as you've driven south on Highway 51 and headed down to Madison. As you come through Wausau, things start getting oaky, if you will. Uh, you start seeing lots of, of uh, 
oaks along the, the roadside, um, more farmland certainly, and, and things clearly are changing in terms of, of uh, ecosystem. So with that in mind, what's the story of, of climate change for Northwoods? And, and I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but first of all, is it real? Yeah, unequivocally real, but it's really important to, to say upfront that not everything is known and that science is this perpetual search, uh, search for truth. It's never the big capital T for truth. Information is always changing and we're in uh, unknown regions here in terms of what we're doing uh, with our climate right now and, and the continual raising of carbon dioxide. So there's a lot of speculation about what's going on. So who can we trust on this? Uh, the best source, of course, are apolitical scientists publishing peer-reviewed papers. Those peer-reviewed papers are going to change some over time as we learn more and more. So that's that's really important to note because a lot of people get skeptical about the science and say, oh, you know, it's changing. They don't know what they're talking about. Well, it's, science is never the truth, big T's. It's always small truth uh, and, and evolving as we understand that. So should we trust their models? And what I think is really uh, it, it, terribly important to understand is the scientists can run their models backwards to assess their validity. And all that means is here in 2022, you can go back to 2014 and what, look at the model that the scientists uh, thought were going to occur and see if those models actually did occur. What we know today is that what happened, what we thought was uh, happened in 2014. And yeah, by and large, they, they're very accurate. Uh, if anything, they, they are, their assessments were uh, too limited, that, that things are going faster and harder than, than the scientists thought. So. That to me is proof that these models are, are by and large very accurate and we can trust them. Okay. So there's lots of scientific data. We're going to just throw a little of this out, then we'll get into particular species. Carbon dioxide's rising, as you're all well aware. Here's the cycles over hundreds of thousands of years. And you see that incredible spike um, going up here just really in the last century. And here it is on, on a smaller scale. A graph again. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, where we're now up at 417 or, or higher parts per million, a 50% increase pre-industrial times. And the last time, you know, we were this uh, high in carbon dioxide was a mere three million years ago, uh, when the temperature was, you know, somewhere around five degrees higher than it is or was in pre-industrial time. And the sea level was 50 to 80 feet higher than it is today. So we're in some really uncharted ground uh, unless we look back 3 million years ago and try to decipher how things were back then. And of course the charts show a, 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 a confluence of temperature and carbon dioxide increase, just throw it out here to make sure there's no question that temperature follows this increase of carbon dioxide. But one of the key factors here for us to understand is that once carbon dioxide is added to the atmosphere, it hangs around. It hangs around for centuries. Um, it's not something that can go away. I think we're used to understanding that, like water pollution, geez, if you just close off the pipes or you close off uh, the source of pollution, you can clean things up pretty quick. Well, we can't clean things up pretty quick on carbon dioxide. It remains in the atmosphere for somewhere between 300 to 1,000 years. I can never quite get a straight answer on exactly how long it lasts, but for a very long time. Thus, uh, all these changes are gonna endure uh, well, again for centuries. And so it's important to think of this as a filling of a bathtub, use that as the metaphor, that even if we reduce our emissions, we're still adding to the bathtub, we're still adding to the bucket until we hit net zero, until we hit where emissions are equal to uh, the take up of carbon dioxide by natural processes or other technological means. And so even if we reduce the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, it's just adding on to already existing uh, amounts in the bucket in the atmosphere. So here's, here's your uh, trends of estimated temperatures going towards 2100. And it's a very, very scary path. Yeah. Important Four point five centigrade. To a centigrade. Temperature. Important also to note how much uh, variability there is. Uh, across the country. And I think this causes a whole lot of confusion uh, because one size doesn't fit all. Look at the, the variability in temperature change. When where you see the most temperature change by and large is far Northern states. And particularly when you go up into Alaska and 
far northern Canada, that's where we're getting the largest change. But even down in far southern California or in the tip of Florida, look, you know, there's the changes. And in between, there's a lot of variability. Even down in Georgia and Mississippi, for heaven's sakes, they're getting cooler. So I can see why people would be skeptical of the science when uh, looking out their back door and watching their own thermometers, they may say, hey, I'm not seeing what these guys are talking about. So science often goes over our heads, all kinds of technical stuff. But what I wanna do is emphasize what our practical observations are telling us. What, what, what can all of us note easily enough? So I became convinced uh, uh, of the reality of, of climate change 20 years or so ago down in Madison when I went to a conference. And I heard revered uh, limnologist John Magnuson, Magnuson give a talk on uh, ice cover and the diminishing nature of ice cover worldwide. And he shared dozens and dozens of slides at different lakes where there's long-term data worldwide. Uh, but specific to Wisconsin, he shared some slides on Lake Mendota and Lake Monona, and I'll just give you the Lake Mendota one. And you can see how for the last 150 years or so, a, a very significant downward trend in how long ice is lasting on that particular lake. And if you look uh, at, at the data or, or the text at the bottom of this particular slide, uh, John said that you know the, the decline is a full 25%. It's a month less ice than what we had 170 years ago when we, people just started looking out the window and saying, this is when the ice goes on, this is when the ice goes off, and we're gonna count that number every year. John also looked then at a number of other lakes uh, around Wisconsin, and there's more data than this. It's hard though to get long-term data. People weren't taking ice uh, data in the mid to early and later 1800s. So we have a lot of short-term data, but not a lot of long-term. But so you'll notice that on these six lakes, there's a later freeze up in general and a later and an earlier breakup in spring. So this is across the board uh, on all of our lakes in the state that were, that ice is less, okay? And, and I think it's a very easy jump then to say, gosh, things are getting warmer if we don't have as much ice. Woody Hagee, some of you may know Woody and, and Inga down in Oneida County, live on uh, Foster Lake, part, part of their lives, otherwise down in Madison. And Woody's been keeping data now for 46 or so years on Foster Lake. And he's noted that in the last uh, uh, 23 years, the average ice update is now eight days later than it was for 22 years prior to that. So he's got, it's not long-term data. You gotta have the longest term possible because there are short-term variability, variabilities you have to, have to accept. Uh, but he's showing a very clear downward trend in terms of the amount of ice, the duration of ice. Let's look at the ice on the Great Lakes, uh, downward trend of ice cover on all the Great Lakes. Lake Superior's annual maximum ice cover is now since uh, the early 70s down 22%. Um, and I thought this was really fascinating, a graph of the length of the boating season in Bayfield. So uh, I imagine some of you have gone up to Bayfield in the winter and driven across the ice road to Madeline Island. The ice road in the last uh, number of years hasn't even existed, uh, such that the, the ferry owners, the, the ferry folks over in the summer from Bayfield to Madeline have had to keep running all winter long. They don't want to, they want to get, <laughs> they want a vacation for one, but they need to get their boats out of the water so they can do maintenance on them. But if there's no ice road uh, that allows people to drive between the uh, Bayfield and Madeline, uh, they have to get people back and forth. So they have to stay working. And so there you can see this, this trend of uh, shutting down for ice and, and how many days they used to have off. And now for the most part, no days off. The ice road, I, I believe is still not uh, in existence in Bayfield. Someone can correct me, but I don't think it's, it's frozen up yet this year. Lake Ontario shows a similar decline in ice. We won't spend a great deal of time on here, but another 20% or so decline in ice. Here's the decline in ice on Lake Erie another 20% or so. So what? So the decline in ice is true on smaller lakes and relative to the Northwoods where we are so lake rich, this means that we're gonna have more evaporation uh, of our lake waters because we have a longer period of sun hitting that water. We'll have warmer waters. And when we have water, warmer waters, we have more plant growth and more algal blooms in, in general. Uh, so this is a serious issue for us. Our, our lake waters are warming 
and that has impacts on all of those aquatic species uh, who, some of whom require colder water. How about snow cover? All of us who love to go snowshoeing, got some decent snow right now, which is great, but it came pretty late this year, took a while to get here. So climate scientists are projecting that snow cover is gonna drop by about 40% in Northern Wisconsin over the next century. That's a lot. Uh, where it's not gonna drop, interestingly enough, is up in the UP, and it makes a ton of sense that the UP is actually gonna increase in snow because that's the snow belt. And if, if Lake Superior is warming up, you have all that now warmer air coming across open water, bringing all that moisture, hitting cold land mass. And that's why we have such enormous snows up in the Ironwood area and up into the UP. You know, the record snowfall is 393 inches. That's just crazy to consider. <laughs> that's 36 feet of snow, for God's sakes. You know, so they get just an incredible amount of snow. But that snow belt ends halfway through Iron County here and goes across the top of, of Vilas County. And, you know, and once we hit that height of land uh, of the Northern Highlands, about 1,700 feet, then it decreases. So when it's snowing up in Ironwood uh, and they're getting a, a foot of snow and in Hurley, we're getting two inches down here in Manitouish. We're only 26 miles away, but we're on the other side of, of uh, that height of land of the Northern Highlands. And so they'll have a lot more snow. That, that'll be the epicenter of skiing and snowmobiling. You buy land in the UP right now. <laughs> Get, uh, it's going to be worth a lot. For, for winter recreation. But this lack of snow has, has implications for a lot of wildlife species. There's this area called the Subnivian Zone uh, in, in the snowpack where we have a lot of, uh, uh, of small species, our, our, our rodent species living at that ground level in the Subnivian Zone. And if, if you don't have that snow, all things get messed up uh, in terms of now exposing those, those uh, very important uh, bases of the food chain. Uh, now to not having a place that they can stay warm underneath that snowpack. And that affects the predators associated with them and so on. All right, so ice is one practical way we can look at, at uh, climate change occurring. How about gardening, okay? Well, we look at the hardiness zones and, and if you're not familiar with what it means to be zone three, which is what we all used to be, zone three meant we would almost every year have extreme winter temperatures between minus 30 and minus 40. So that's zone three. If we were zone two, it'd be minus 40 and minus 50. Holy smokes. Okay. Now we're no longer zone three. So look at that hardiness zone in 1990. You'll see that orange says that we were minus 30 and minus 35 for the most part. And over in that interesting section of Northwestern Wisconsin, even a little colder. And now look at just uh, 20 years later, we're now zone four. And for us gardeners, that we're all kind of cheering that, uh, to tell you the truth, without really thinking on that larger scheme of, well, this has consequences. Um, if you look at it uh, countrywide, again, check out the 1990 map, look at zone three is all that black going through the top of Wisconsin and Northern Minnesota and the Dakotas and Montana. And look at its shrinkage now, and there's barely any left of zone three. You know, so it's easiest for me to think about climate change. If you're a gardener, most of us should know that we have fewer frost, uh, frosty days. So when we moved here to Manitouish, the big city of Manitouish in 1984, we've been here 37 years, we would plant our tomatoes and they would immediately get whacked by frost. And we learned that frost always happened here up till June 12th. And we learned the hard way because we kept losing all of our warm weather plants, our green peppers and so forth. So we learned never to plant before June 12th. And we learned that we better get all of our hot weather plants in by August 20th, because we invariably had a frost by August 20th. That gave us a 70 day growing season, which is utterly pathetic, but that's the way it was. We always brought in green tomatoes, never had them right for the first 20 years we lived here. Now these last 17, 18 or so years, we are generally frost free as of June 1st, although I think we had a frost this year closer to June 12th, but by and large, we can now plant as of June 1st and our frosts don't occur now until mid-September, even into early October. So we've profoundly increased our frost free season. But what happens around August 20th now is it gets down to 35 or 36. You get that, that night where you should have had a frost that would have been 31 back 20 years ago and now it's 35 and it doesn't frost and we get by and now we, we get another month of growth and we got 
tomatoes coming out the yin yang. I mean, it's just great. I mean, from a gardener's standpoint, again, most of us are cheering for this. But remember, the winter is what makes the North Woods. You know, it is who we are. Cold is determines who we are as a as a biological community. And when we change these 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 lengths of the growing season, and we become more like uh, a Madison, that has implications. Okay, so we talked about peer review papers and what to trust. Uh, the best place, I, if you don't know about it, is to go to this website, wiki.wisconsin.edu. Wiki stands for the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. And so this is made up of our best scientists in the DNR and out of the university, who, if you go on their website, have charts and more charts and more charts. And we will look at a few of these charts uh, that tell the story of, of climate change in our state and give us projections. So please go there for the best peer reviewed and specific information on Wisconsin if you really want to know specifically what's taking place here. So let's look at a few of their charts. So here's the change in average winter daily minimum temperatures. DGF stands for December, January, and February. TMIN is for temperature minimum. So our lowest temperatures are now significantly warmer our extremes, and that makes sense because now we're zone four, we're not zone three anymore, right? So we're up about seven or eight degrees on average in terms of the extreme cold that we ordinarily get, okay? Not so much in Southern Wisconsin, interestingly enough. So again, this variability is important to note. People are gonna experience different things out their windows. Here's the change in our average daily winter, again, December, January, February, maximum temperature. So we're not warming up quite so much. We're not having so much warmer days in, in terms of the maximums, maybe three or four degrees warmer, uh, but we're much warmer in terms of our minimum temperatures. How about uh, summer daily average temperatures? Not so much. The big change is in winter, not so much in summer, intriguingly enough. And that's why you need to get a climatologist <laughs> to speak with you, because I can't explain it. It's out of my league. All I can do is look at the graphs and say, here's what, here's what they found. And so we're increasing by about three degrees in the last 70 years or so. Um, but that's, you know, but that's not, uh, that's huge, frankly, but it's not as huge as what we're doing in the winter. How about change in annual precipitation? Are these slides coming up, hopefully at the same speed I'm speaking? I hope there's not too much of a delay, are we okay? We have very slow internet up here. Uh, anyway, the change in precipitation is uh, not so much in the Northwoods, 5%. Look at southwestern Wisconsin, 20%. Again, this, this remarkable variability just within our state, and then again, to spread it out throughout the Midwest and throughout our country, again, creates confusion on what people hear as averages and then say, oh, that doesn't fit my experience. So you can go on to the Wiki website and you can pull up any city you want and you can say select the decades. And so I selected 1960, selected Milwaukee and then selected 2020 and the difference in average annual temperature is four degrees, okay? So it's kind of interesting. You can you know, find your specific area and, uh, and see what the change has been. All righty, so let's, let's leave those graphs and get down to the naturalist aspect. So what's the impact of all this? And I wanna immediately say it's really complicated. It, it just isn't, it's not cut and dried stuff because where an animal or a tree or a shrub lives is, is more than simply temperature. It's for trees, it's all these things I list here. And for wildlife, it's all the things I list there. If you're not familiar with interspersion, interspersion is just uh, where within a habitat, you're gonna find food and cover if they're not interspersed in a way that that is that works for an animal. If the food is too far away from where you breed or where you find cover and you can get predated in between, that's an issue. Uh, structure is really important. Uh, some birds, for instance, need shrubs. They don't necessarily need cold or warm. They need shrubs or maybe they need grassland habitats, so forth. And some need microhabitats. And if you don't have the microhabitat, you may not have an ability to, to raise young in some manner or another. So there's there's a lot of things that go into any individual species. Every species has a wonderful story to try to learn. That's what's fun about being a naturalist is you're always confused and you're always learning. And at my age, always forgetting as well. So you get to learn all over again, which is wonderful. Um, and then you have T 
repeater, timing, duration, extremes, and repetition, which throws things even into a more complicated uh, circumstance because it matters how long a rainfall lasts or how long a, an extreme cold period lasts. And it matters when that happens. If it happens in March or April, the cold, extreme cold, when animals are starving, they'll die. But if it happens in January, like right now, well, they're, it's, you know, they're, they've got some reserves, so it's okay. And the repetition, maybe you can survive one or two times of certain thing happening, but the third time is the straw that broke the camel's back. So all these factors have to be thrown in here. I want to impress upon you how unique the Northwoods is and, and by doing and doing so through using a bunch of range maps. So we have a bunch of Northern tree species that reach their southernmost range uh, in the Northwoods, okay? and then go way up into Canada. And these are species that use extracellular freezing. And all that means is they can go down to minus 80 degrees and they will freeze. But what they do is they take the, uh, the, the water in their cells fundamentally and remove the water from the cells and put it in between the cells. That's now intracellular or extracellular where that water will freeze, but it won't burst the cells. Okay, it's a handy little trick. So now you can freeze. Uh, we have frogs that do the same thing. They freeze in the winter. Wood frogs and spring peepers and so forth are down only three inches into the ground and they're frozen right now. You can stir drinks with these little guys if you're going to dig them up. You know, they're frozen, but the, you know, their cells that themselves aren't frozen. The ice is between the cells. So anyway, here's balsam fir. So again, if we, you can see that goes almost exactly on uh, the tension zone line that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. So if we move the tension zone up, we're moving balsam fir's range up. And will we lose balsam fir? Yes, we will. Will we lose white spruce? Look how far north white spruce is, a little further north really than what uh, balsam fir is. It goes way up into Canada, way up to the tree line. How about black spruce? Same deal, and you'll see some interesting variability in these range maps where there's little areas where they do well. So again, what is true for one tree species is not going to be true for another simply because there's there's life histories life stories for each one of these species that that make them unique how about jack pine jack pine goes a little further south because it, it can do well in these really sandy soils so it goes down towards black river falls there uh, but it goes way up into canada so it's another species we're going to lose though as we move um the tension zone northward now we get into some more kind of complicated stuff. White cedar, a northern species, doesn't go so far up into Canada though, does it? So it doesn't do the extracellular freezing anywhere near as well as these other trees. And it does okay as it goes down along the coastline of, of uh, Lake Michigan, the west coast of Lake Michigan, because it's cooler along that coastline and it really, white cedar really likes limestone. So it's part of its story is it does really well on those basic soils. White birch goes all the way down almost to our southern border, but look how far it goes north, way up to Alaska. So this is a tree at risk. It's one of our few deciduous trees at risk. Most northern, true northern trees are evergreens, conifers, uh, but white birch is one that we are genuinely aware of, uh, concerned about, and will likely lose uh, because of climate change. Same will be true of quaking aspen, even though it goes down into Illinois and to northern Indiana but it's truly a Northern species way the heck up there again to the tree line. It can tolerate all these severe colds. So it's interesting to think that there's a lot of Northern species that can't tolerate being warm. <laughs> we always think, of, we don't think of that as being a limiting factor, but warmth uh, actually can harm a species. So we have other Northwoods trees, trees that are really specific to our transition zone here uh, that don't do well anywhere else. They can't do extracellular freezing. They use super cooling. Super cooling is like putting antifreeze in, in your car. The antifreeze Prestone only goes down so far, you know, minus 30 or minus 35, and then your radiator is going to freeze anyway. And that's true for red pine. And so they it, it freezes out at minus 40. It's done. Okay, but it doesn't do well in warmer areas either. So it's really just in this, this narrow band called the North Woods. Same is fundamentally true for white pine. White pine has a, a larger uh, range goes down into the Appalachians where it's colder up there up on the, the hillsides of, of those mountains down going down that way but white pine has a, has a similar range in that it it's super cool so it, it can only go up until minus 40 is hit and minus 40 is kind of magic number when these trees absolutely 
popping. Hopefully you've all been out on a super cold night, one of those minus 30 nights, and you've heard the trees popping. It's like you're in a, in a gunfight out there. Pow, pow. It's really wild. Hopefully you've all heard that. that those are trees exploding. Those, those, are, those are cells popping. Those are trees dying uh, as you're hearing those uh, popping take place. And it's, I, I want to give you two examples of, of how it's not just all about temperature, but it's about moisture. Look at the range of eastern hemlock. Eastern hemlock does not go into western Wisconsin. It doesn't go at all fundamentally into Minnesota. If you find hemlock in Minnesota, that's a pretty rare species. Why? Eastern hemlock needs a lot of moisture. And as we start going west, you wouldn't think of being over in uh, uh, some of those little towns in, in western Wisconsin as being that much drier than us. But in fact, hemlock says they are and will not grow over in that area. So eastern hemlock is associated with colder temperatures, but it's also really associated with needing a lot of moisture. And then look at the really fascinating range of American beech. We don't have beech trees here in north central Wisconsin. It's too dry. Who would have thunk that over in Marinette or uh, towns over that way, Green Bay, they've got American beach like crazy. We wouldn't think of us here in uh, Minocqua or somewhere in Rhinelander as being that much drier, but American beach says we are. American beach is limited uh, by cold. You can see it barely makes it up into Canada, um, but it's also limited by moisture. So I just give you all that just, just so we <laughs> We remember it's complicated. So here's the depressing map, all right? Here's the recent past, uh, the last 30 years. Look at Wisconsin, you'll see that uh, dark red is maple, beech, and birch, and you'll see the dark purple is aspen, birch in Northern Wisconsin. That's what we've had uh, historically, although we didn't have near that aspen, birch uh, pre-settlement, that was all older growth. It's when we cut everything down, and burned it, we ended up with all those aspen, birch, but that's a whole nother talk. Look at, the, look at the projection. Just compare Wisconsin's colors to, you know, between the two maps and you'll see that that maple beech and birch completely is gone and a dark green comes up here and that's oak hickory. And oak hickory is what you find, of course, down in Southern Wisconsin now, that's the oak savanna. So we're projected to become an oak savanna. It's really almost beyond belief, isn't it? Uh, astonishing, but that's where we're heading. It's again, however, not that simple. Uh, David Milanov is a, a forest ecologist, landscape ecologist uh, down in Madison. He, I'm stealing a couple charts from him with his permission. And so we're gonna see uh, this natural reproduction of these reds and jack pines and more spruce, white spruce. Uh, spruce and black spruce in there too. Balsam fir and paper birch are going to decline and some species may be utterly gone. And we're going to see this migration of southern species north. But, but the problem is trees grow slow and they live a long time. So how are they going to get here? We have climate change happening really fast. Um, but we have trees that grow really slow and we have, need to get the seed source all the way up here. And then we have all this fragmented landscape in between this contiguous forest and area where we live in the north country here and then all that farmland down there so it's a fragmented landscape and how are you going to get the seeds across all those farm fields and so forth unless you got a bunch of birds hauling them up here and blue jays do a fairly decent job of moving oaks around and so forth but you know there's a lot of species don't get moved around uh, by birds near, or near as well so David says what kind of change are we actually going to see well we're going to see some rapid we're going to see some gradual and some's going to be erratic and what we'll see though is gradual growth rate decline. We'll see a decline in reproduction as well. And interestingly enough, we're gonna see a susceptibility to pests and diseases that we don't see now. But there's lots of uncertainty in this because again, we're trying to extrapolate uh, information from 3 million years ago when we had this much carbon dioxide. And there's no comparison, you can't do it. So you're, you're trying to have a crystal ball into the future and see where it's going. There's a lot of good science, but it isn't absolute truth at this point. If you wanna go deep into the weeds, here you go, read these uh, publications and you can, you know, this, this is written mostly for managers of, of forest areas of what they need to be doing. I mean, should we stop planting red pine in the Northwoods because it's gonna be gone? Should we be planting white oaks and red oaks so that, that will make it through? Uh, what should we be doing? Because, you know, again, trees are long-lived. And we're not talking very long until we're into 
if everything stays the same, and you know, we're talking 50 years max to the point when we're at, at to some extreme temperature increases. All right, so this is, I find this really interesting about invasive non-native non insects. If we want to keep a lot of really bad news insects the heck out of the north, the north woods, we need cold temperatures. We need to celebrate when we hit minus 30 and just be dancing in the streets when we hit minus 40. That's very hard to do, but it's what we need to be doing because let's look at emerald ash borer, for instance. They start dying at 10 degrees below zero. But when the temperatures go to 20 below zero, 50% die. And if we hit 30 below, 98% perish. Do we want to keep our ash trees in the Northwoods, our white ash and black ash? If we do, we have to stay at 30 below. We got to have every winter hit 30 below at least, or else we're going to lose all of our ash trees. Okay. And that's why they're all getting lost down south of us. And millions have been lost. What's the number? 50 million ash trees. That's crazy. How about gypsy moss? Same deal. They start dying around 17 degrees below zero. Asian longhorn beetles start dying out at 14 below zero. Remember that invasion of forest tent caterpillars that whatever that was 15 years ago or so, they were everywhere. You couldn't walk anywhere without squishing those dang things. Uh, they can only super cool down to 22 below, okay? So we need to keep really cold winters. Otherwise we're gonna see these guys around way more often than what we want. And then this one really worries me, the hemlock woolly adelgid. We don't have very many Eastern hemlock trees in Northern Wisconsin to begin with, but they have killed this uh, invasive insect, uh, the, the woolly adelgid. It's this really, this white uh, cottony kind of stuff. They're a tiny little insect, the size of a period in a sentence, and they suck the sap out of the stem and the leaves of, of, of hemlocks and kill a hemlock in two or three years. It's just crazy how fast they'll kill them. I mean, they killed millions of hemlocks down in the Appalachians, also up through the Carolinas into Pennsylvania. It's all the way up into Maine, and it's down now into, excuse me, into uh, Michigan, over into Michigan. Um, and so it, it's coming our way. But the only way we'll keep our hemlocks around is if we, guess what, hit minus 30. So all these invasive species that are super cool, that do super cooling, that minus 30 is a magic number and minus 40 is even better, you know? So <laughs> this is a hard one. I try to tell people, this is great when it's this cold. And most of us are shivering. Now I'm saying that when I'm sitting next to my wood stove, granted, you know, that is great. I'm not going out there when it's minus 40, but it's terrific. It's exactly, what, it's who we are. It's who we've been for 10,000 years is minus 40. And now we were all whining and crying because last night we hit minus 20. Minus 20 won't do it, right? So just keep that all in mind. And here's one that's really interesting and scary. You may have read about or seen if you've traveled out west, the millions of pine trees that have died. These lodgepole pines because of Western Canada mountain pine beetle and it's because things have warmed out there. And now these pine beetles go through two generations in one year, all this stuff, one way or another, they're a native species, but now they're let loose because of warmer temperatures and they're killing all these trees. And here's the big worry is that if you look at this map and you look at pine trees, remember jack pine, how far it went over through Western Canada? Well, look at where these range, the areas of this pine distribution overlaps, that dark, uh, those dark areas on the map. Um, over there, and what would that be? It's not Man it's that Manitoba. I'm losing Saskatchewan, whatever that dang province is. Oh man, that's terrible. But anyway, uh, the, these pine beetles are going to be able to march across northern Canada and make their way down into white pine and red pine country via jack pines. That's a big fear of a lot of ecologists that this species, which has been stopped by the by the Canadian Rockies. Uh, it's not going to be stopped as we continue to warm. All right, let's look at some mammals. How about snowshoe hares? Look at the range map of snowshoe hares. It's a central to northern Wisconsin critter. And, you know, it's a, it's a species that does fabulously well in, in heavy snow, deep snow. Look at the size of their feet. It's a size 42 foot, okay? Think about all around a size 42 foot as a human being. That's kind of what, what their foot is. Um, and so they can stay on top of the snow. But their range boundary is moving northward because of declining snow cover duration. It's also moving northward because of their molt. Think about the fact that they molt 
from brown to white in the late fall, and then they molt, of course, from white to brown in, in spring as we're losing our, our snow. If that molt is occurring too soon, or well, let's just use too soon. If, if you're turning white before the snow comes and you're on a brown landscape, you're a pretty big target. And if you're turning brown in April before, you know, you're still white and the snow's gone away and you haven't turned brown yet because you're not supposed to have by all the history of who you are DNA wise uh, and you're white and now you're on this brown landscape in the spring again you're a big target so we're there's some real interesting articles about predation on snowshoe hares increasing and how these guys are going to have to move north and that brings us to cottontail rabbits and cottontail rabbits have not been a northern species even though this range map shows them going all the way through northern wisconsin by and large they weren't here at least in my experience in Manitowish, they weren't here for the first 20 years we lived here. We had too much snow by and large. So they have little feet and they can't deal with if we have three feet of snow on the ground, they can't stay on top like those snowshoe hares can. So they've had to be a Southern species. They're moving North as the, the snowshoe hares are moving North. So they're now quite common in the North woods. Let's look at moose. Um, man, moose are really having troubles not only in Minnesota, but over in uh, New England. Tremendous decrease in numbers. Um, where there used to be 8,000 in Northeastern Minnesota, they're now right down around 3,000. And uh, Northwestern Minnesota down to 100. It, same is true in hugely declining numbers in uh, New Hampshire and Vermont. And one of the big reasons, and I apologize for the grossness of this particular slide, is a, it's a critter called a winter tick. And we're all familiar with ticks up here, wood ticks. And these winter ticks ordinarily are controlled by severe winters, but where we have warming winters, these ticks can now survive throughout the winter. And they latch onto these moose and they end up 30 ticks per square inch of flesh. I've had, I've read accounts of 50,000 or more ticks on an individual moose, if you can imagine. And so here's you know cow moose that's scratching off all of its fur to try to get all those ticks off and now they're dying of hypothermia. There's other issues associated with moose and why their numbers are declining. We're at the far southern edge of moose territory. I've often wondered why we don't try to introduce moose here. Well, we, we, don't, we shouldn't bother because as things warm up, there's just not a prayer that they're gonna do well here. A couple other species that are far northern species that are likely to get lost as a naturalist that, that hurts my heart. Uh, fishers, not a lot of people like fishers, but you know, they're a predator on the landscape, they're doing what they do. Um, the numbers have declined actually in the last decade or so, uh, but look at how far north they are ordinarily. Same is true of lynx. I've never seen a lynx, but we're at the far southernmost edge. Look at how big their feet are. Their feet are enormous. And that's, thus they can have flotation. They have snowshoes basically on, on their feet so they can go up into far northern Canada and stay on top of the snow. Compare the size of a Canada lynx paw to a bobcat paw and now bobcat are moving further north because again, snow cover is decreasing. So here's, here's some of the changes we're already seeing um, in, in some specific mammals. American marlins are a far northern species. Again, look at that range map way up into Canada and to Alaska. We're at the southernmost edge of the range very likely to lose what few martins that we have in our area. There's winners and losers though in all of this, right? Um, who's going to be the winners? Well, here's a winner, the opossum. Uh, they're moving north and they, you know, I thought this was interesting. They reached the Great Lakes area just in the past 200 years. And now they're, uh, some people are telling me they're up in Rhinelander. People, I don't know if anybody can shake their head and say, yes, they've seen them in Rhinelander. Um, but they're, you know, they're, they have exposed ears and uh, tails and, and toes, and they will freeze off in a cold winter, uh, leading, of course, to starve to death if that happens. But as, the, as we warm up, these possums are moving north. And then there's white-tailed deer. And I couldn't find a 2021 fall deer population estimate, so the earliest one I could find was 2018. So let's just look at deer densities. Let's look at Iron County. When people cry and cry about how few deer we have in Iron County, where I live, I think it's fabulous. I love deer, but I love the fact there's not very many of them because look at that slide to the right, which shows a deer exposure. This is on uh, in Boulder Junction. And I think you can guess which side of the fence the deer live on, right? 
the amount of browse that deer do in the understory of forests is, is astonishing. It's five pounds of woody browse a day, and that's mostly buds. Put up, if you own land, put... I always love Zoom talks because then the phone rings. But if you, if you got uh, some land, put up a deer exclosure. Put up a whole bunch of deer exclosures and see the incredible reproduction that will take place within that area. Make sure you also put up a snowshoe hair exposure down at the bottom. Put some uh, uh, chicken wire down at the bottom so rabbits can't get through because they will cause some issues as well. But if you keep those two critters out of there, man, will you have reproduction. Anyway, look at the density as you go further down south. I don't have my reading glasses on, but man, if you're looking at one county, they're at 68 deer per square mile. <laughs> That's nuts. That's a lot of deer. Okay, deer are going to move north more and more and more as we warm up uh, because there will be more uh, and easier easier winters to survive. It, it's, it's just a, a simple calculation. It, there, we'll have more. And we'll have more raccoons. Okay. Let's look at some birds. We're in the richest bird area in all of North America, but you didn't know that. Look at the dark green going across northern Wisconsin and northern uh, Minnesota and northern Michigan up into Maine. We have the the largest number of breeding birds of anywhere north of Mexico in our particular region in this north woods transition zone between the boreal forest and the southern deciduous forest. Way cool. It's a great place to be a birder. Okay. So if we have climate change, we're going to, you know, there's going to be some winners and losers and there'll be some who don't care. Robins don't care. Look at the range map of robins everywhere. <laughs> See the one white dot over there in uh, Utah? That's the salt water or the uh, salt flats, Bonneville salt flats. That's the only place in all of North America. Robins don't live. That's crazy. Um, so they'll do fine. Red winged blackbirds, look at the range map of them. Not going to impact them. They won't care. Grackles, grackles will do fine. Year round is all, you know, all the way from Texas all the way up through, up into well, up into Canada. They'll do fine. And for some uh, uh, neotropical, or for some neotropical species, neotropical means ones that that winter in Central and South America. So they'll do fine too. Look at the range map of indigo buntings. They breed all the way down in the southern, all in the, in the southern states. So it's, if, if we move that tension zone north, not gonna, it's not gonna worry an indigo bunting. They'll do just fine. Same's gonna be true of of, uh, of tanagers. Um, They'll do just fine too, because their breeding range goes all the way down into Alabama and Georgia and so forth. Even though they winter way the heck down there into South America, you know? It's pretty crazy how far these birds have to go every year. Now we got some interesting ones that are, I think are real questionable. What's gonna happen for winter wrens? So there are species that, that nest just a little ways down below the tension zone. So we're gonna move that tension zone farther north. How far do you have to move it before they're no longer breeding here? Don't know. It's one of my favorite birds. It has a beautiful song. Hopefully you've all heard it. It's just a little tiny dynamo of a bird. Dark-eyed juncos, the same deal. They, they breed just in northern Wisconsin, okay? They do winter, though, not far south of here. All they need is open ground. So they, they'll start wintering here more and more as the snow cover gets less and less. And whether they'll stay breeding here, though, is another question. Um, Hermit thrush, one of the most beautiful songsters in the, in the north woods. Look at that breeding range, just northern Wisconsin. And then wintering down in southern Illinois and, and uh, Indiana, we, we may start seeing them in the winter, but we may lose them as a breeder, which would be really sad because they won't be singing in the winter. They're only going to sing during the breeding season. So I'm going to run through a bunch of birds that are northern nesting birds. They're north or at the southernmost edge of the range. Yellow rump warblers. I'm not going to spend much time on these. Palm warblers. If you're not a birder, you're not going to care. The quote that, that always sticks in my mind is Aldo Leopold saying, we only grieve for what we know. If you've never seen a palm warbler, warbler and how pretty it is, and someone says, we're going to lose palm warblers due to climate change, you're going to kind of go, uh, yeah, okay. I mean, <laughs> I don't know a palm, never seen one, I don't care. But so part of this whole issue of climate change is we have to become more ecologically literate. We have to be come just so much more familiar with all of these species, fall in love more and more deeply with the North Woods because we only conserve what we love. And, we're, and you have to love all of it. 
You need to know as many species as you can. It's a lifelong endeavor, but you need to go for it. Black-throated green warblers, look at their range map. We're gonna lose those. Range map of black-throated blue warblers, that's just far northern Wisconsin. Gosh, they're a beautiful bird. They have a great song, beer, 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 bee. That's <laughs> a great song. Canada jays have a great story. You know, they only nest just barely down here. Uh, and they're no longer nesting in, in our area. We have done a Christmas bird count here for 29 years. The first 15 years, we always had gray jays. We haven't had them for 15 or so years. I don't have the exact number in my head. And part of the reason is that they're our earliest breeding songbird. They breed in late February, for God's sakes. They're out of their minds. But so how are they going to feed chicks into March? Well, they, they are in November, October and November into early December. They have the largest salivary glands of any bird in North America, and they grab food and they coat it with this sticky saliva and they, they make little spitballs of all this uh, food and they stick it in trees all over the joint. They're caching food everywhere. And they will pull that food off those trees and march and feed their young. What a crazy idea, but that's what they do. Now, if we have thaws in the winter and all that food that they've stuck in the tree now, you know, falls down on the ground, no, no Canada Jays, and we're already seeing that. We're already seeing Canada Jays moving north because we're having more thaw events in the winter. And most of us celebrate those thaw events. Ain't it great in January if we get a thaw and we're up to 40? That's hallelujah. Not if you're a gray jay. How about common loons? We're gonna lose common loons. Hopefully that will distress a lot of people because that's one bird that everybody knows, okay? And we're already losing them. If you're not following uh, Walter Piper's blog, go to loonproject.org and follow everything this man says because he's got the best science in all of North America at this point. And he's been studying loons in, in Oneida County for all, 30 years now or almost 30 years and he's already showing a significant loss so you can read all that in in the number of chicks in in the chicks that reach that do survive in reaching five weeks of age and then those chicks that do are in poor condition and not as robust and fewer loons are coming back from uh, uh down in uh the gulf of mexico you know they're down there and they come back in their third year only half as many are coming back as used to come back what's happening to them what's going on so the entire adult population has fallen by 22%. It's going to continue to fall. And if his model is correct, he's saying that we're going to lose one third of all our loon breeding territories by 2031. That's nine years away. Let that sink in for a minute, okay? We're going to lose one. Now, he may be wrong. And he, he's perfectly open about it. He says, I don't know if this is going to happen. But that's what my model is showing over 30 years of data of what we're losing. We're going to lose one third of our breeding territories. That's pretty crazy. Another bird we're going to lose, pine warblers. See that northern range, only in northern Wisconsin. All right, so here's January temperatures again, just showing you this long term increase in winter temperatures, warmer, warmer, warmer temperatures. And our average has gone up like five degrees continental wise over the last 40 years. And so uh, Audubon took this and just said, let's, let's do an analysis of bird populations. I'm just gonna fly through some of this. And what they're finding is that of 305 species, they looked at 186 are moving north. 61% of the observed species are, they're showing them in winter, in Christmas bird counts, people where they hadn't been seeing them in, in Christmas bird counts in 1980, now in 2010 and 2020, they're seeing these species. And classic for us right now is we're seeing things like cardinals and red-bellied woodpeckers and turkeys, for God's sakes, you know, uh, we're seeing a bunch more species. I thought this was quite the statistic. 48 species have moved, have moved, have moved northward by more than 200 miles. Wow. So is climate change happening right now? And yeah, <laughs> it's been happening, but it's the invisible present. It's very hard to see unless you have this data over time. It, you know, you see it in terms of a crisis if a hurricane hits you or something, but you can even try to explain those away because hurricanes have always happened, you know. But again, it's the long-term data of duration of these things, intensity of these things, and, and how often they're occurring. So birds that are coming our way again, winters, winners and losers, who's coming our way? Carolina wrens. We'll have these guys probably nesting here, maybe within our lifetimes, depends on how old all of us gray hairs are. We may it may be up here in 20 years or so if we're still tottering around in our 90s. Who knows? Summer tanagers are coming our way. They're already, this 
range maps rather old. They're actually nesting in southern Wisconsin already. Pretty bird. Tufted titmice coming our way. Okay. And we already have cardinals. Uh, you know, cardinals used to be common, and they still are, of course, in Wausau. I remember my wife was raised in Wausau. We'd go down and visit. They always had cardinals there. But as you came north, they fell out. And if you found any in Rhinelander, oh, man, that was pretty rare. And you didn't find them up here in the big city of Manitouish. Now we've got a female cardinal at our feeder, and we, we have cardinals regularly. We don't have any breeding ones at this point, but there's lots of people around who now have breeding cardinals. So here's a bird that clearly has moved north, and the data is not just about Wisconsin, but about lots of northern states. And then, of course, the story of wild turkeys that historically had never been in the Northwoods, and now they're everywhere. And it's a fascinating story when I still don't fully understand how they just took off quite that much, but <laughs> here they are. Red-bellied woodpeckers, their original range did not include northern Wisconsin, and I know all kinds of folks that have them not only breeding in their backyard, but then wintering over. Hopefully some of you do. I mean, they're a pretty bird. And there's birds that now remain the winter that didn't historically. Uh, uh, morning dove there on the left, is the one I want you to look at. That's a fox sparrow on the right. Don't worry about fox sparrows. They're a northern Canadian breeding species that just migrate through. But uh, we have morning doves that last the winter now. In the first so, 20 years we lived here, morning doves never stayed the winter, but now they always do, at least around us. I don't know about you folks. So uh, was it Nina Leopold Bradley that took, uh, I think that was her, that took her father, Otto Leopold's, uh, phenological data from two decades back in, 19, uh, in, I'm sorry, from the decade of 1935 to 45 and compared them 60 years later to the decade of 94 to 2004. And she looked at 108 events, 75 dates of first blooms and birds and climate events. And she said that she tried to determine what was advancing, what was not doing anything, same the, staying the same and what was delayed. Okay, trying to see, again, climate change wise, if we can quantify what's actually happening based on really good data. And what she found was of short distance migrants, the migrants don't go very far, uh, like Canada geese and robins and Northern Cardinals, surprisingly, you know, they're, they're coming back way earlier. Canada geese coming back five weeks earlier, robins three weeks earlier. And this again was from the 1990s. So I imagine here in 2022, they're coming back even earlier. And interestingly enough, on one later white-throated sparrow, I don't know how to explain that. Interestingly, the long distance migrants are less responsive because long distance migrants that are down in South America and Central America right now drinking their pina coladas, they come back based on photo period. You know, they're waiting till the light changes. They don't know what the weather is up here. They just take off. Usually it's the uh, first week or so of May and they're coming north and they show up here about May 10th to May 15th to 20th because that's historically when spring finally happens here. Um, and so they just come based on that photo period. And now we're having this, this disconnect between uh, climate change making springs come earlier and these birds come in later than, than that. And there's great concern about that. So long distance migrants are not being affected so much in terms of coming earlier. They just come at the same time, but it's not telling us what's important. What's telling us how are they surviving once they get here? If the insect hatch that they were relying on to feed them on the way up is no longer there because it already happened and has gone by, for instance. Let's look at a few fishes. Uh, brook trout are likely to be extirpated. They're a cold water fish. We go up to 5.4 degrees increase, we we'll lose almost all of them. And the big deal up here is about uh, northern pike and walleye as our waters are warming. Uh, we're losing walleye. That's a big deal for a lot of anglers. Um, and it's more complicated than just temperature, but clearly while I need colder water, and as we continue to increase temperatures in our freshwater lakes here, we're gonna lose walleye. Interesting statistic down here at the bottom, two, two studies, a quarter of lakes in Minnesota now have phosphorus levels so high that the state advises against swimming or boating in any of them. And then there was a study of 400 temperate lakes from around the world found that on average surface waters have warmed by seven degrees Fahrenheit. And when you warm up water, it holds less oxygen. Cold water holds the most oxygen, warm less. So they're losing oxygen. And this has some profound consequences for fish that need, that need high oxygen uh, within, within the water column. All righty. So some future projections. 
Lord knows I have no idea what the time is. I'll try to go fast. Um, let's look at what's going to happen with uh, percent change. And uh, my screen is blanked out at the top because I have a, I think is, is uh, should be precipitation. Is that right? I hope that's what it says up there. I have a bar that goes across uh, my titles here. But anyway, we're going to have. Yeah, it says change in M-A-M-P-R-C-P in parentheses R-C-P four five. M-A-M? So March, April, May, does it say precipitation? What does it say? Precip? Yeah, precipitation. Good. All right, thanks. <laughs> I don't know how to get rid of that bar that was across here. But anyway, that so we're going to see an increase in precipitation, which isn't too great at this point, 5% they're saying. Uh, for us anyway, but uh, what, what's going to happen is we're going to have these rising water tables and we're already having this, so we're going to have more spring floods as we get more groundwater, um, more annual, uh, annual total amounts of water and, and heavier rain events which go into our lakes and rivers, we're going to end up with a lot more flooding. Um, and so the percent change, uh, again, is what, 10%? Um, not dramatic, but it's going to show uh, southern Wisconsin is going to see a 30% and one third increase in the number of large rainfall events. And that's a big deal because that's where we get our floods and where we get the most erosion. Um, increase in, in uh, temperature, golly, six degrees by 2060. That's a lot. That's a lot. Change in average winter daily minimums. Daily minimums, so it's, and it's going to be seven degrees warmer in terms of our minimum temperature. So again, in those extremes, we're going to be more like zone five here pretty soon, not zone four. We're going to have fewer colder, extremely cold days. So if you look at that chart on the left, below 32, we're going to have, they're showing 35 less days below freezing by 2055. That's kind of a remarkable statistic. And then the number of days uh, below zero, when we get some of our extreme cold for northern Wisconsin, that's that orange, that's 20 less days that are going to be below zero. That's nearly all of our days. Really, we don't have that many days below zero. How about heat? By mid-century, we're going to have a lot more very hot days. For northern Wisconsin, we still, you know, we rarely get above 90. Thank goodness. I melt when it's 80. Uh, we're, but we're going to get 10 days more above. 90. Boy, you look at southern Wisconsin, though, and down into Iowa and places like that. Holy buckets. You know, they're going to be seeing days above 100. 10 more days above 100. 15 more days. So let's just bring it down to earth. Here's Wausau's climate in 2080. We'll feel like uh, Otumwa, Iowa, which is right on the border with uh, Missouri, basically. Okay. That's 10.5 degrees warmer. Fahrenheit than Wausau right now. So what, what should we do? Well, first of all, we should engage ourselves with the precautionary principle. We should uh, follow this note that, you know, look before you leap, right? We should take every uh, cautionary measure that we can before we, we jump in to do something, right? Uh, and, but even if something's not established saying, boy, we don't have the absolute uh, proven silver bullet of things we're going to need to to move forward to protect places uh, if we show tremendous risk. So we need to engage ourselves in the precautionary principle. And I want to make sure you understand what net zero is because this gets a lot of people bent out of shape. They think net zero means no emissions. We're never going to get to no emissions. We're going to need things like jet planes that you know, you're not going to fly them on solar power. Uh, we're going to have a lot of emissions yet, but net zero means that point when emissions of greenhouse gases are balanced by methods of removing them. That's where we need to get to. So we're not trying to eliminate all burning of oil. We're going to need to burn some oil. You know, and, we're, and interestingly enough, cement making, uh, which I didn't know this, uh, releases a huge amount of carbon dioxide. Who knew? Okay, so anyway, we need to to drop carbon uh, dioxide emissions by 45% by 2030. And we need to reach net zero by 2050. 
to keep us at only 2.7 degrees increase, which is still going to have some major ramifications. We're still going to lose a bunch of species, but at least it won't be a wholesale loss. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to uh, reduce the use of fossil fuels. And the way we do that is by increasing renewable energy, decarbonizing transportation, and increasing our energy efficiency. And where we have carbon emissions that we can't get rid of, we, we need to still use, we gotta have carbon offsets and that's planting trees and, well, paying, for, I thought this was interesting, paying farmers to reduce some of that synthetic fertilizers and plant cover, and to plant cover crops and to car, uh, do some carbon capture if we can and storage, that's still in experimental stages. But the problem with all of that is it can perpetuate business as usual. And most of these, uh, uh, resolves that people are, are voluntary. They, they don't have any teeth. We need to have something that says there will be a big penalty if we don't do take these actions. So there are pledges to get to net zero that I thought this was great. You know, Finland says 2035, we're going to be there. There's a number of countries that are already there, very small countries that are already in net zero. Iceland and Austria, we're saying we're going to get there by 2050. No, we need to get there sooner. And then we have some countries that are pushing it out further, and that's China and India, Saudi Arabia, and so forth. So what's hopeful? Um, I thought this was great. The 2020 was the best year in history for global wind at 53% increase, uh, but we need to still increase install wind power three times faster than what we're doing in order to get to net zero by 2050. But it's so exciting, I mean, I'm 70 years old now. I remember, you know, being 40 and thinking, God, wouldn't it be great if we had wind turbines everywhere? We have wind turbines everywhere now. You drive through Iowa and drive through Kansas and places that it's just wind turbine after turbine after turbine. It's fabulous. Texas leads the, the country in wind turbines, even though it leads us the country, I think, in oil as well, you know? So it's happening, but it's not happening fast enough. We have to keep pushing. We have to be on the, on the accelerator pushing this. And it's really about China and then US making it all happen. We're the ones that are generating the most wind. And I thought this was intriguing that in the first five months of 2020, renewables outperformed uh, coal and nuclear power. Uh, during those first. So, you know, there's a lot of good going on. And it's easy to get terribly depressed and overwhelmed and, you know, and throw up your hands, but we're, we're doing a lot of great work. Um, my question remains, uh, is it fast enough? And I'm not smart enough to say that. It doesn't seem like it is, but we are still, we're still pushing it hard. And people just need to, to keep pushing hard on politicians and everyone else to make this so, and on themselves to make it so. Uh, we need to invest more in, in uh, community solar. You don't have to put up solar panels on your house necessarily. You can buy solar from con community solar installations. And there's some big ones going up into Wisconsin right now. We put solar collectors on our house. Here's our 22 collectors. And we get about a thousand bucks a year uh, here in Manitowish off of our collectors. Um, you know, and the payback is, it says here 11 to 12 years, our payback is in seven years. And after that, we get free electricity. It's pretty cool when the sun's out, we're making money. I, I still am not quite used to that. I think it's great. <laughs> I was like, well, the sun's out, we're making money. What a deal. Uh, electric vehicles, yeah, really moving forward again. But again, it's got to go faster and harder in order to get to where we need to get to. Uh, but wow, again, 30 years ago, that was a dream. So we got to keep in mind how far we've come in a relatively short period. We have to keep in mind how far we have to go in even a shorter period. President Biden wants to get us to 50% of the U.S. market by 2030. I don't know how practical this is up here. We have to drive for pretty long distances up here, right? To get to most of anything. And we got a long winter, but it certainly is practical for central and Southern states, uh, not only for electric vehicles, but for solar and a lot of wind as well. You know, so it's hard, to, you know, don't think of our experience as the normal. Our experience up here with so much cold is not, isn't the normal of what the rest of, where the population centers are in, this, in the country. So trying to get to closer to a wrap up here, I thought this was really intriguing. Uh, we are showing an increase in the number of people that are um, accepting 
climate change occurring. And that's hugely important because once we accept it and achieve the appropriate concern, we will push our, our uh, politicians and our, and our business leaders to do what they need to do. Uh, and so we now have uh, this breakdown of six categories, the alarmed 26%, which I assume is most of you on this uh, presentation, otherwise you wouldn't be here, concerned 29%. So that's 54% are alarmed or concerned. 19% are cautious. It's happening, not sure exactly, you know, but that gets us up over 70%. And then we have this, oh gosh, 25% or so that are disengaged, doubtful, or utterly dismissive. It's a conspiracy theory and you know, it's blah, blah. So it's growing though, we're up to, you know, again, moving forward. And I think most Americans are worried about it. One study I saw that I thought was most fascinating was they took a political group that I won't mention what, what party it was from who we're saying as a group that there wasn't climate change, but then they took people out of that group setting and they talked to them one on one and every one of them said, oh yeah, I'm really concerned. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, discuss it in a group. And why won't we uh, believe in a lot of this science? It's because of these two things, confirmation bias and motivated reasoning. We're motivated um, due to economics, we're motivated due to the political parties we, we are engaged with to not believe. Um, and I love this, we're, we're still all in high school, which means that we're still really, really influenced by our peer group. And so, you know, there's danger if you go against your peer group, you lose friends, you might lose job opportunities, you might, you might lose influence. If you have a bunch of people who say, ah, oh, it's all a hoax and you say, yeah, it's really not, you might be on the outs. So there's a lot of this peer identity stuff. And we're all lawyers. We all cherry pick the information to confirm what we already believe. So that's that confirmation bias. So it's uh, in Upton Sinclair's classic uh, quote, it's impossible to make a man understand or a woman understand something if his salary depends on his or her not understanding it. And that of course is the crux of the matter in large part. So never doubt that one person can make change. Here's Greta. Yeah, what a remarkable story. What was the tipping point that mattered? That's such an intriguing issue. How, how did she make such a difference? This one young lady in Sweden, how did that happen? Why? And I, that one person idea, uh, Kathleen Dean Moore, who's one of my favorite authors out of Oregon, has written a lot about uh, climate change, has given all of her life now to trying to alter climate change. And she talks about one person making a difference by, you know, share what, share your gifts, the, you know, your resilience, your organizing experience, and that there's joys in being a part of this caring people. And she, she asks us to think like a river. And I think this is really a cool uh, metaphor to make a deflection of the current, make an obstacle, make it carve a new channel. You don't have to stop the river. And that's what makes a lot of us give up is we think we have to make it stop. No, each one of us needs to make an obstruction you know, make the river just change its course a little bit. And it's not a sacrifice to do that because everything we now are doing is gonna sacrifice all that we care about. I see some typos in what I've written here. So it's a different way of doing things. You need to say yes to things too. It's not just saying no, heat your house without burning something up, transport yourself without burning something up, feed yourself without burning something up. You know, if there's a way for the river to flow, it's gonna change its course. And she says to make the invisible present visible. And that's what we're in is this invisible present. How do we, how do we see climate change for what it is? Because it's so slow moving. You know, you can't just walk out the door and say it's, I see it now. Because you know, it's not, it's not a pipe that's sending out effluent into the river, and you can say, there it is. That's that's the source. Stop it. It's very hard. And and we need to make the invisible present present. So here's some books. You know, there's lots of books that need to be read. Here's The Great Tide Rising by Kathleen Dean Moore. That would be a book I'd recommend because she's a philosopher. And so it's not just the science, but it's the philosophy. What's the morality? What are we being called to do morally? And she addresses that, I think, uh, brilliantly. You should, if you haven't already, go to the ICP, I'm sorry, IPCC, National Panel on Climate Change and look at their reports, because this is where all the scientists around the world come together and they all agree. Now tell me when that's ever happened on anything else where 
a group of people from every country come together and agree on something at the end. That just doesn't happen. But it does happen at these IPCC meetings. So I'm done. Here's you know, a bunch of books I've written. And I'll end with this cartoon that reminds us to have some fun. Go out and explore. Um, go out and fall more deeply in love with the world. That's, I think, again, what we're called first and foremost to do. And from that love will come our conservation. So I'm done. I have no idea if there's anybody left on this talk or if it's <laughs> five o'clock and getting dark. I don't know. I apologize if I went too long. But okay. time for questions, comments. Okay. To John, this, this is Louise here. I yes. have been monitoring the um, chat box and we do have a few questions. Okay. Um, several of them you have, you have answered um, in part, at least um, already. From Mary Ellen, it feels very hopeless for me and I know I'm not alone. What can we do as individual homeowners to have the most impact for our future? Well, there's a bunch of things, but that still makes you feel hopeless because you're just with that one person. And I tried to suggest that that one person idea adds up if all of the League of Women Voters, that's a lot of you, start doing this and start modeling how it can be done. Um, people want to get on bandwagons. People want to, I think most people want to do what's right. And most people recognize this is a crisis and, and want to be on the right side of things, but they often don't know. So we put up our solar collectors, for instance, to be a model, to be able to say, you know, it's not, it's not like you're in Texas, you're not going to do as well, as, but you can do pretty darn well and you can get a payback and with the, with the tax incentives, you know, in seven to 10 years or so. And after mm -hmm. that is free energy. So it, it can be done. Um, mm -hmm. You can do a lot of things with your diet. I mean, there's a whole lot to be said about reducing uh, intake of meat because it takes a whole lot of plants to feed, to feed, uh, uh, livestock so you know just re, you know reduce you don't have to become a vegetarian but you can dramatically reduce the amount of meat and you'll find you'll be you'll be plenty healthy i'm vegetarian for 46 years now you know i'm, I'm still talking a little bit breathing <laughs> so uh it can be done and you can be very healthy you don't so i'm not i'm not trying to get up on a, a you know a soapbox and preach that it's just that's one thing you can do you can you know, as much as you can, energy efficiency, all the things we've been talking about for 20 or 30 years, do what you can, model that, talk with people and talk gently. I mean, there's a lot of skeptics out there and, and uh, we, don't, we haven't been changing anybody's mind by telling them they're dead wrong and what's wrong with them, that you doofus, <laughs> it doesn't work. You know, hear their stories, find out what they care about. I think what, you know, the thing that crosses all political lines up here is that we all live here because we love the North Woods. If anybody came up here to get rich, they were out of their minds, right? I mean, how, you, didn't, you didn't move to the North Woods to make a whole lot of money. You moved up here because you loved water and you loved woods and you loved what those values gave to you. And it may be that you fish or you hunt or you watch birds or you just love to sit on your pier and enjoy whatever that value is. That's the crossing, that's the intersection between all of our disparate uh, political opinions, that, that brings us across the chasms. So how do we talk about our love of place in a way that tr uh, transcends all our political differences and say, okay, you know, this is at risk. This isn't, this isn't about supporting political people. That this is, you know, if you want to ice fish, your ice is going to be fundamentally gone. And ice fishermen already know this. They already know it's slushy out there. They already know they're having, it's not as long. Snowmobilers know this. You know, let's just Let's be real. I'm sorry. So that's part of what you can do. And of course, try to get, bring it, bring the invisible present here. And politically, we just need to have the moral commitment to create the change we have to create, even though it's going to, it would it appears to be difficult when in fact, there's tons of studies showing it's going to open up all kinds of economic op opportunity. And it's going to be a really good thing uh, if we can do it fast enough. But again, we're filling up carbon dioxide in that bucket and we just, we got to stop. We got to hit net zero quickly. Sorry. We have another question from Linda. How long do we need to have the cold temperatures to kill insects? I think she's referring back to when you talked about the insects not 
dying on the right. tree. Right. So here's, <laughs> here's the problem with those statistics. So you don't have to have it very long. I mean, minus 30 is minus 30 from what I understand. So it doesn't have to be more than a day necessarily, but there are microclimates. And so if you're doing the science right, you're gonna say it's gonna kill 98, 99%. But you might still have insects that are on the south facing slopes that have full sun going on them. And it might be 30 degrees, minus 30 out there. But if you have the full sun and you're nicely nestled inside a bark of some tree that's, that's a dark bark and you're absorbing heat, some insects are still gonna survive. So okay. there'll always be a pool of insects that, that will be out there. But what we wanna do is, is keep knocking it back every year so there's only that one or 2% that survive. Okay, John, would you quit uh, sharing your screen so that we sure. can um, right. see the people? At Stop okay. share, my yeah. fault. There we go. <laughs> right. um, another question, um, there are some people who recognize that climate change is occurring, but they say that humans are marginally responsible. So maybe humans don't matter. Well, that's called that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, that's one of those, you, know, you just, I don't know. Uh, you know, some, some folks just don't wanna hear it. And I don't know necessarily how to cross that boundary. You know, I've seen a lot of good studies talking about it. You just have to, it's built on relationships. You know, mm -hmm. you got to talk with folks slowly. Most people aren't going to have an epiphany and say, you know, I've been wrong all my life. You're right. And I'm going to change my mind completely right now. And thank God you exist. But it's just not going to happen. There's going to be a slow change in understanding. So all you can do is keep working slowly with people, not demonizing them and saying, look, it's completely linked to human use, completely linked to our, uh, and you know, show them some articles and say, you know, these are out there if you wish. It's been pretty clear that data isn't making change in a whole lot of minds because you have that motivated reasoning confirmation bias stuff. So you're only gonna read what confirms what you already believe. But if you can find somebody in the middle ground who's saying, you know, I'm just not sure, link them up to the, the best articles. And, mm -hmm. Don't expect sudden change, work slowly and kindly. From, from Steve, we have his comment. He said, we purchase our power from Acadia Power. It is an offset of energy purchased from WPS. It costs an additional $5 per month. And he included a website for that. And, and so that I'm not familiar with it, but is that coming therefore from some uh, energy source, non-fossil energy source, I assume, either solar or wind. You can do that, yes. And I, I think most energy companies are, are making that available to us to purchase from non-fossil fuel sources. Do it. One other question was uh, from Mary Ellen, uh, and it had to do with the avian impact of wind power. Mm -hmm. um, is the trade-off worth it, she says. Yes. Um, Good answer. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> well, well, you know, what they're finding is it's the siting of wind power that's the most important thing. So where we're siting most of our wind power are, are not in narrow valleys that force migrants to go through and that's where the most wind is. Where we've done that, it does have dramatic impacts on birds because birds in migration will be forced through that valley. But if you're out in a big farm field in Iowa and it's just as flat as a pancake and you've just got turbine, 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 you know, for miles, really we're not showing significant losses to birds at all mm -hmm. compared to the losses in birds that we're seeing from the increase in carbon dioxide leading to heating, da, 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 all the things we've been talking about. So yes, it's a necessary trade-off. There is no perfect absolute solution that will have no harm to any darn living what well, doesn't exist. So we have to be willing to accept some harm. Another question from Kathleen. What happened to all the insects last summer? <laughs> well, that's a great question. Um, and I don't know. Um, 
other people have been asking what happened to all the birds. There was a limited number of songbirds last summer. That's one I can answer better because I really don't know. I'm not aware that there, we had lost that many insects necessarily. So I'd love, I, I haven't seen those articles. So I apologize to Kathleen. I can't answer that question. If So if you don't mind, I'll just swerve and say we had fewer songbirds this year. I didn't hear but one time hermit thrushes singing this summer. And that was due, most ecologists are feeling due to that big freeze they had in Texas. That was in March, wasn't it? Or early April when the migration was starting to take place and a whole lot, bluebirds too, a whole lot of birds died down there at that time in that very extended freeze. Um, but insect populations, I, specifically to last year, I don't know. I'm sorry. Thank you, John. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Dorothy because our time is up and we'll see what she has to say. Okay. Yeah, I, I heard um, at the bottom line, a finisher there, John, and I wanted to keep that last slide up of that cartoon because... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love Car but, Calvin and Hobbes, yeah. Yeah, that's such a fine way to end. But I, uh, I heard from you speak softly, slowly, persistently, keep track of the science. Um, yeah. and, and I just want to add, as far as what we can do as individuals, in addition to what we can do individually, we can join a group, an organization, <laughs> like the League of Women Voters of the Northwoods and then there, and there's Green Fire and all those others. Uh, I see David Barnhill is on here. Thank you, David. Um, so, so there are groups that le led by spectacular individuals like yourself and we do more, we can accomplish more as a group. So um, I guess I'll leave it at that and just say thanks uh, ever so much to our speaker, naturalist John Bates. Thanks to all of our attendees who prompted a lively and further enlightening Q&A. And of course, thank you to our Northwoods League Program Committee for organizing this event. And um, we hope to see you all back and join us as either, uh, the public is welcome to all of our presentations, whether you're a member or not, but we're always looking for more members. Uh, our next Northwoods League monthly meeting will be a program on the, on the 8th of February, when the topic will be getting to know the Northwoods League. So more about who we are, what we do, how we do it. More information will be forthcoming about that meeting. We welcome all of you, as I said, to join our presentations and our activities, which are focused particularly on empowering voters, defending democracy. And that's a pretty wide open mission. And uh, you certainly spoke to it very well today, John. Thank you, well done. Thank you. So 